From the heart of prelights, the preprint highlighting service run by early career researchers and supported by the company biologists, this is Spotlights. Hello and welcome to Spotlights, the prelights podcast that highlights the stories behind the most exciting biological preprints, putting the spotlight on the early career researchers who spearheaded the preprinted work. My name is Jen and I'm joined by Ethan and Rainier and we will be your hosts today. In this episode, we're joined by Dr. Nafisa Jadugji, an assistant professor at Southern Illinois University Carbondale, and also by Dr. Chris Smith, a neuroscientist who is a postdoctoral affairs program administrator at Virginia Tech. Today, we will discuss their preprint, an updated and expanded characterization of the biological sciences academic job market. So welcome and thank you for joining us, Nafisa and Chris. So let me get started with the first questions. I was kind of very curious when I was reading your your study about what the primary motivation was behind it. The academic job market is quite a, a sore topic for many people. It's quite a complicated set of data to analyze. So I was kind of wondering what you what your opinions are and what your motivation was. Sure. Um, well, we um, we started this like uh, I think two thousand. 17 or 18 ish when we were part of a slack group a future pi slack um amanda and i and i think chris also was on the job market the faculty job market and so we were all you know going through this lovely process (laughs) um that is so much fun and um you know there's not a lot of we realize there isn't a lot of data um kind of guiding people it's this elusive kind of you get some feedback from your faculty advisor your pi mentors and there's nothing really known about what you need to be successful and so we launched um a survey uh, that looked at the job market um, in terms of biomedical scientists, because that's what we are. Um, and we uh, published those results in eLife, I think, in 2020. And we've continued this collaboration somehow um, with our busy jobs. Um, Amanda is a faculty member. I am now as well. Ari is. Chris is an administrator in a postdoctoral office. Um, and we've continued um, looking at the job market because um, we're really interested in, you know, like our eLife study brought out so many more questions. We've continued with this line of research. We've received funding from Burroughs Welcome. And so this uh, preprint that we're talking about today is a continuation of our data that was published in 2020, which I think was the 2020. 2018 job cycle. And so now we're following it up with 2019 through to 2022. So we are looking at the, um, we also have another preprint looking at the effects of the pandemic on the faculty job market. We've also branched out into social sciences and humanities um, to try and understand that faculty job market. So we've recruited our funding from Burroughs Welcome Fund actually allowed us to recruit a social scientist to help work um, with that data. Like I mentioned, we're all biomedical scientists. So we have kind of that. That's how we think about data. So it's really nice to have this other piece. Um, and we're moving into that uh, field of qualitative data analysis because the job market is so complicated. You can have all the numbers, like all the first author publications, the H index, the grants, but there is this other aspect to it, um, this more qualitative component, fit, pedigree, all of that, that we're wanting to look into. Um, And so with the recruitment of social scientists, we're we're starting to do that now as our research program is is, uh, growing. Chris, do you have anything to add? Uh, sure, I can add a few things. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're trying to provide more transparency to the job market and empower trainees with knowledge to make a decision about their prospects. So, so you did mention you have an earlier paper in eLife um, that's an earlier, that's looking at earlier cycle. How does that compare to this preprint now? Do you see change in the trends of what people are looking for on the job market? 
Yeah, so this is something that's really cool about our work. Now we have some longitudinal data. Um, we changed some of our survey questions from our 2018 study because we learned a lot <laughs> and we've revised things. What we're consistently seeing both in our current preprint and our previous study is that the number of job applications you submit really corresponds to the number of interviews, offers that you get. And so we're seeing that consistently, which is great. Um, and we're, we recruited uh, someone that could do a lot of uh, machine learning. Chris recruited her, um, Lily Chang. She's a co-author or Yu Chang on the preprint. And she did some cool machine, machine modeling uh, learning data. I don't really understand how she did it, but she looked at correlations of what components um, uh, make you competitive on the job market. And this is, I think, figure five in our current preprint. So we have these factors like um, the number of applications you submit, which positively correlates to um, getting an offer, whereas the number of postdocs doesn't, or your gender or your age. So we're hoping to continue this analysis in our subsequent data collections to see if, you know, it stays consistent. So we have data from 2022, 23, 23, 24 that we're working um, through to see, and hopefully we plan for Lily to run these same sort of um, machine learning analyses to see if this is consistent. Um, and, you know, with this longitudinal data, we've also launched our dashboard on our website. I think Chris linked our website. So this is an avenue where we're making our data publicly available for trainees, postdocs, graduate students, people on the faculty job market um, or thinking about going on the faculty job market to see where they kind of land in terms of the numbers. But the numbers, like I said before, don't predict success. There's a lot more that's involved that we're starting to begin looking into. That sounds really fascinating. I have a more of a, a, a personal kind of question in the sense, like how do you, I was wondering if you could comment about the number of postdocs, for instance, because that's something that a lot of people have this misconception about. The longer you do more postdocs, the longer you stay in academia, the better your chances actually might be. But you seem to find a negative correlation in your study. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on that as it's quite a hot topic for many of us. Yeah. And I remember when I started um, my postdoc, my PI was like, you need to do at least two postdocs. You know, in the biomedical sciences, you have to publish papers. These take time as you're generating data. But I think there's a certain threshold, and we're hoping to look at that in more detail with our qualitative analysis. So in terms of, you know, um, as you increase the number of postdocs, your your chances decrease on on getting a job offer, which is, we were at the MPA, the National Postdocs meeting, Chris and I, um, and we presented this data and it brought up a lot of questions too, because it is counterintuitive. But I think there is a certain limit um, where, you know, you, it doesn't add to your, um, your uh, application, but it's also important to note here, this is data from our survey. Um, so it's, you know, looking at a very specific population, you know, um, that responded to our survey. So it's not every um, faculty job market candidate. This is just giving us some insight into the, the market. So I think it's always important to have that, that this is not the be end and end all. It's just some insight into what's happening. Yeah, that's really, it was something that shocked me a little bit for myself because yeah. I myself am quite far into about seven years now of postdoc and I'm now starting to kind of apply for faculty jobs I've been a little bit worrying when I started considering that apply for as many applications as you can and I think women often we have to make sure that we match all the components of the job uh like add but you know if you match sort of roughly then just apply because faculty the search committee is always Things are so fluid, right? So you you want to throw your your name in the the ring or the hat. <laughs> so is that what you'd kind of consider your most kind of important advice from this kind of study? If you had to kind of give us a takeaway message for it, what would you tell us as postdocs or as early career researchers to do? So I think you know we present a lot of new data here, and as a scientist myself, we see again in another cohort of of job market, faculty job market searchers or postdocs or whatever, 
you know, that the number of applications submitted plays a huge role. So we saw that in our 2018 study, and now we're seeing that again. So I think that's the the strongest message. This um, data that we present on the number of postdocs and all of that, you know, if we see that again in our subsequent studies, you know, then that's potentially even more powerful too. But, you know, um, uh, we need to sort of repeat that and see if we're seeing that in our, our other data sets. I mean, I think that's really what I would say is the main take home, right? I mean, people think, oh, I need one more year, one more year. But every time you wait, you're potentially missing out on positions that are good fit. Because like that perfect position might not even exist next year if you wait. So I think that's the big takeaway that I have from all of this. And I wouldn't make overgeneralizations beyond that personally. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that make it hard to dissect. Like, I don't think you should also read our data and say, oh, I'm too far gone. I can't apply either. I, mean, I, I think it's it's nuanced. And like every situation is so different. And there is this kind of black box of, you know, fit pedigree um, search committees, which we're hoping to try and get more insight into. So we are, you know, in the process of applying. We've applied to the Spencer Education Foundation here in the U.S. We're applying to the National Science Foundation um, in the U.S. as well to get more funding to get a more comprehensive look into the, the job market. But it's important to remember that everyone's situation is is different. And like Chris said, you know, um, it's, I think, really important to try. Um, and then, you know, looking at uh, job ads, you know, that are loosely fitting, you know, search committees sometimes change their direction depending on the applications they get. So it's important to to keep that in mind that they're, um, it's not black and white. It's a, a lot of shades of gray. <laughs> So I'm just wondering, kind of based on that, you mentioned things are quite personal, and I was kind of wondering if you could give us a little bit of a talk about your own personal journey with actually finding the jobs you're now currently in and what kind of challenges you had to kind of overcome or what you faced when you were kind of looking for these positions. Sure. So I've been on the faculty job market twice now. Um, what personal challenges have I faced? Oh, I've had lots of interesting questions while I've been at in-person interviews. So, you know, am I applying for other uh, positions? Do I have a husband? Do I have children? Uh, you know, I've been given feedback that I didn't act like I was a PI, a principal investigator. Um, you know, uh, it's, yeah, a lot of these questions come up uh, and it can be quite um, daunting and you can be, you know, you have these wonderful um, experiences on campus interviews. You meet with everyone. You have collaborations coming out of the wazoo and then, you know, people ghost you <laughs> and don't respond to emails or inquiries or you don't hear back. And, you know, um, this second round that I was on, I was invited to several interviews and then, you know, people just kind of dropped off and, um, they didn't end up hiring anyone for the positions, which was kind of concerning. But I mean, in the end, you know, the the, the you need one offer. <laughs> so that's all that's needed. Um, and, you know, it's important to to be strong and know that it's going to be like a hard, hard road <laughs> with feedback, with no feedback. And so, you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of forming your own community, your own support system in academia and outside of academia, because it is hard. Um, so, uh, yeah. And, you know, reach out for feedback on um, materials, job talks, you know, get as much feedback as you can. I was wondering, Chris, if maybe you would like to talk us through, because you're now at a different kind of position than simply going to purely assistant professor position. So it'd be kind of good to hear your perspective on how you feel about that you know, transition from maybe a very academic based job into more of a, you know, uh, helping or uh, more of a behavioral studies type position. Uh, so, yes, uh, I mean, you know, my position now I'm supporting postdocs. So, I mean, obviously, many of them think they want to be faculty. And I think that's great. And I think the other thing, and I don't know how Nadisa feels about this, but I think one thing we hope our work does is, you know, maybe this is not the best wording. 
But I do think being aware of your competitiveness is important. So you can decide, okay, is this worth me continuing to pursue? And we're not here to discourage people from pursuing these paths, but we also don't want people to become permadocs and keep trying and playing the one more year syndrome. Like I personally don't want that. So I think our hope is that this gives people more of a sense of like, okay, I've submitted whatever, more than the median number of applications the past year or two, and I haven't gotten any hits. So, you know, I would argue that suggests probably you need to start thinking about the next career path. And I think that's important to just make sure people have agency and are considering, you know, what else they can do with their training and not persisting, you know, too long in an effort that may or may not lead to the outcome they want. So I think that's important. Um, and I think, you know, uh, there isn't great data out there on this whole experience. So even just having something people can look at to kind of give them some sort of sense of where they're at, I think is very helpful for them. Um, and people who come, you know, to the U.S. and North America from other countries that also think need you know, perhaps more information, right, about what this looks like um, in terms of, uh, again, competitiveness might be a strong word, but, you know, benchmarking yourself uh, against at least what we know from our data, which, again, as the piece has mentioned, I would not say is completely representative of the entire applicant pool, because I think our success rate in our data is like close to 60 percent get an offer. And that's probably much higher than you would expect. It's really kind of interesting to know that you're kind of in that way of like helping postdocs to really understand like what their next stages might be if it's not in terms of following an academic career path, which I think is something that lacks a lot in certain universities. You don't always get that kind of support and advice that you need in order to make that transition to something else. But I was wondering, kind of following up on that, do you find any kind of trends as to what people then decide to go into after their postdocs if they choose not to follow an academic career? Uh, well, we don't have very great data on postdoc outcomes. So, uh, you know, it's hard to say, I think, at any sort of definitive high level. Um, but, you know, people go work for for-profit companies in different capacities. Um, the other thing I think is often underlooked and something that we would like to look at in our data. I think it's hard because our data is skewed to research intensive positions, but there are a lot of other types of faculty positions out there that frankly could be better fits for people in their in their skills and interests. But I think they're in a system where they don't know a lot about the other faculty roles, so they don't consider them. Or perhaps they're in positions or situations where they're actively discouraged from applying to those types of positions, which, again, is a whole other topic. Um, but I think, again, there could be good opportunities for people who are interested in more of a teaching focused role or working at a you know comprehensive institution where there'd be some master students and some teaching. Um, so I think those are pathways that they do end up pursuing. But I couldn't give you a sense of like what that percentage is. So. Oh, it's really great to kind of know that there are other opportunities out there. I was kind of wondering if it's sort of a relating back to an actual previous question, just more of a, uh, a curiosity. I was wondering if you thought about expanding your study out to other countries. I mean, of course, it's very focused in sort of North America, but I was wondering about, you know, things in places like Europe or in South America, where I'm based, for example, because the job market is quite different there and you might see quite different patterns. Yeah, I mean, that would be great. So we do this research on top of our like full time jobs. So I think um, we're hoping to uh, get some more funding um, and then potentially, you know, form collaborations. Um, but it does take a lot um, to to do this data analysis and a lot of resources. So I'm not sure if that's something currently on our our docket, but it's definitely something in interesting to consider we do can you know we do collect data from Canada and the U.S. Um, and then I think we've gotten some European data but like you said the job market is so different and we would need people that would be interested in those countries to lead that um, so you know we have our website and if people are interested they can reach out to us <laughs> I was wondering, because you said you expand to the humanities and social sciences as well at some point. What what do you expect to see in that, in that regard? Something completely different or something similar to the biological sciences? I mean, uh, I think these are the questions, right? I mean, the questions is, is what 
one needs to be competitive for a different type of uh, discipline different. I mean, I think that's sort of why we're doing this. Um, I think our social science person, and if he's a, you know, you can add on to this, you know, would probably say uh, prestige and pedigree might play a bigger role in the humanities and social sciences, but we don't know that definitively. Um, that's a very interesting question we're looking at in all of our data or trying to look at. Um, as you can imagine, that's a much more dense analysis because it requires us to take uh, self-entered uh, text from where people did their training and assign it a uh, you know percentile or whatever you want to call it in terms of prestige or pedigree and then look to see how that maps to outcomes. Um, but I think that's something that, again, could look different in different fields. Like it may be more important where you train in certain fields than others. But I don't know if that's true yet because we haven't looked at it. I was just wondering, following up on that, I wonder if you were planning also to look at if somebody was a native English speaker versus not, because that sometimes can have a role in how people perceive you as well. Certainly here in, in South America, that's something that's prioritized as our students being able to speak English well and interact with the community in English. That's an interesting question. We haven't specifically looked at that in our data. We're, we've been interested or what we've considered in the past is like visa status, especially in the U.S. with all the changes. Um, uh, and then we were really interested in the pandemic and, you know, a lot of job uh, job offers were retracted and things like that. Um, but, yeah, English is yeah something that could be considered definitely. Um, we're always thinking of different ideas and we have to sort of tame it in <laughs> because we only have so much um, time, resources and, and things. So yeah, we wish we could. I mean, I think that's sort of what's powered us too, is that we're so interested um, now that we have a, when we have a core group of people that we meet regularly and, you know, try and and move this work forward. And we've been really fortunate to have um, some support from Burroughs Welcome Fund financially to get our, our um, studies and our work moving forward. And hopefully that funding will kind of, you know, launch us into other grants where we can hire more individuals to do more of this work. I was kind of wondering more from like a, a personal perspective, like how do you feel now that you have an academic position like a, a more secured academic position than a postdoc is it what you were really expecting or is it something that has kind of thrown a lot of surprises at you and has kind of not necessarily met your expectations or has met your expectations so I um so I'm in my sec second faculty position and I think my, the I thinking about to my first, when I first started, I didn't realize how much decision fatigue, or I didn't even know the word decision fatigue there is. And like, you become a little CEO, not a little, but like, you know, you, your HR, your time, uh, like um, project management, your, you know, writing, um, coaching, you're a psychologist, <laughs> you become one. And like, I just didn't realize how much it of, of it was. And I knew that I didn't have this training in, you know, like team management, leadership and things like that. And so, um, you know, I sought out opportunities to become a better sort of CEO and leadership and, and that kind of development. It is a lot of work. It's really hard, but I really enjoy it. I love working with the students. Um, you know, sometimes the administrative work can be a little bit monotonous, but, you know, I think I really love what I do and I'm happy to be here. It's, you know, um, sometimes it doesn't feel like work, which is great. And then sometimes it does. But that was sort of what I was aiming for was to find something that I really enjoyed. Um, and, you know, we get to pursue questions that we're really interested. So this collaboration, we've been together, I think, for several years now, maybe like seven or so or a little bit shorter or more. So it's nice to form these collaborations and friendships and, and grow together and learn together. Um, and it is nicer to have the stability. Um of a faculty position uh, than the postdoc. I had my son when I was in my first faculty position because I finally felt stable enough 
to, you know, kids need lots of stuff <laughs> and time and all of that. So, you know, I felt comfortable with that. So it's definitely been nicer. Um, yeah. Not as frantic as a postdoc is. But then I think a postdoc is a lot of fun because you don't have so many responsibilities and you can just do the science. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what would be your one piece of advice for somebody really, once they're starting their faculty position, what should they really do in their kind of first stages of learning how to become a faculty member? Um, what to do? I think, you know, um, lots of people will give you advice, you know, depending on your university, a mentor might be assigned to you. Really take, you know, the advice um, that works for you and, you know, leave the advice that doesn't work for you. Do what, you know, feels right to you. You know, you need to get grants. You need to write. You need to be your very own postdoc. You know, hire good people um, so that you can delegate and focus on what's important, which is grants, writing, um, and, you know, um, be flexible and know that it's going to be hard, but it's a it's a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> So I imagine that you're quite busy a lot of the time as well, because it's quite a, a busy position to be in. And I imagine you're both actually quite busy people. But I was kind of wondering if you could give us an insight to what you do in your free time. What do you do as your you know, routines and hobbies? What are your welcome distractions that allow you to keep some of your sanity while you're working? Uh, I'm probably overly committed to my work, but that's a whole other topic. Um, but I do try to take, you know, my little morning walks and I listen to podcasts and learn stuff. So that's uh, that's my little outlet. Um, I have a two and a almost three year old son, so he keeps me really busy. Um, he's a great distraction from work and just, you know, kind of letting loose and playing and having fun. I also love to bake. Um, and I try and exercise regularly. It's a good uh, stress management. Um, but yeah, my son uh, helps kind of I don't believe in a balance. I don't believe that there's a work-life balance. I think it's always like a, a moving uh, pendulum. Like you work a lot or you are you have to be at home a lot with family and stuff. So um, I think he helps me kind of, um, you know, just get a break from work because that's so important. And I always tell my students, you know, take a break, you know, go away, step away from your work. But I'm also so bad at taking that advice. <laughs> <laughs> I think most academics I've met are quite similar. <laughs> and to want to take a break and don't quite follow through in that. So I can completely understand where you're coming from. <laughs> Do you have any more questions you wish to? Yeah, I think we're approaching the end. Um, Jen and I are postdocs and potentially looking for academic jobs. So Thank you all for <laughs> conducting these research and, you know, um, it's very much helpful. Um, Good luck and be strong. You'll get through <laughs> it. <laughs> so I'd really like to thank Nafisa and Chris for joining us. It's been a very interesting conversation and just thank you for your time as well. Yeah, thank you guys for this opportunity and profiling our work. We appreciate it. That's it for this episode of Spotlights. We'll see you next time. All our episodes are available on the Prelice website. To keep up to date on each episode's release, follow us on Twitter, Mastodon, Facebook, or register on our website. See you then. Mm -hmm.